let's continue. <clears throat> what I was thinking of is that some of us guys find it very easy uh, to be helpful to good-looking women. Um, is our motive uh, pure? <laughs> Probably not. Because then there are other women that we find less attractive that we couldn't care less what happened to them. We don't hold the door. We don't say good morning. We don't say, can I carry that for you? We just go marching right ahead of them. But let a good looking woman come or someone that we're attracted to and we bend and bow and scrape and say, we'll carry it. Even if it's too heavy, we're happy to do it. God looks at that and says, you know what? That guy's disingenuous. His motives are not pure. His motives, even though he did what looked to be righteous, is unrighteous. And so this comes out in the final judgment of believers. That's another thing that, remember the parable of the wheat and the tears, that uh, you will find that some of your most trying experiences in life, people who test you the most, are in church. They're part of those who say we are the body of Christ. And we're tempted sometimes to, to pass judgment and say, you know what? That person is awfully mean-spirited. You know what? They, they, they're not really believers. The Bible tells us that we ought not judge one another and leave it to God to determine what's wheat and what is tares or weeds and that he's the righteous judge and that we're not because, like Samuel, we can only see the outside. All right. So we're created to do good works. What is dead if justification by faith does not produce good works? If we're justified by faith and we don't have good works, it means something in us is dead. What is it? The answer is in James chapter 2 and verse 17. James 2, 17. What's dead? And that's it. Faith. Thank you, Sal. That is absolutely correct. You see, <clears throat> genuine justification by faith always produces good works. Not sometimes. Always produces good works. However, the believer may not be aware of the good works since they are fruits of the Spirit. Did you get that? Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, it's faith that's dead. Yes, that's what James said. But I'm trying to explain that and say that we may not always be aware of our good works because they are fruits of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And I'll demonstrate that. Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40. And in that passage, it talks about good fruit. So read that. I won't post it. Matthew. Well, actually, I'll read it to you. Why don't I do that? Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 25, 34 to 40. Matthew 25, 34 to 40. And here it is. It's long, so I'm not going to post it all. <clears throat> then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry. Remember I, I, I repeated this to you? Do you get my drift? This is where it's coming for. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And Jesus answers, when you, when, when, or no, and then Jesus says, the king will, or the king will answer, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it unto me. Did you get that? When, <clears throat> when we do it to others, least, 
the person who we are least comfortable with in my illustration about about the good looking woman versus one that is less attractive to us perhaps perhaps if there is no dis differentiation except a person in need we do better and according to this scripture that's the case because Jesus says if you do it to the least then you've done it unto me good works of a believer are profitable to whom who are good works profit who do they profit Titus chapter 3 and verse 8 is the answer Titus chapter 3 verse 8 I'll fetch it Titus 3 8 who profits from our good works from a believers good works anybody well, let's read it this is a trustworthy statement and concerning these things I want you to speak confidently I want you to be confident about it so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds these things are good and profitable for men now what's he talking about whenever the Bible says for men it's it's talking about the people in this world mankind and so our good works okay are not for ourselves no 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 it's not men in the sense that it's good for you and me it's good for others okay so that um, good works don't save us but they give evidence to other people that the gospel of, of the power of the gospel of God unto salvation so that because we're saved we do good works we don't do good works in order to be saved you get that our salvation is a gift and it comes from Christ and that's it there's no one else involved in the salvation but when we're saved we are, we are obedient we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we do good deeds and that is an influence on people in the world I say man that person's awfully nice it goes that way they're looking and they're persuaded by your good deed what clear evidence proves that we are the followers of Christ John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35 the proof is that we love one another remember <clears throat> you shall know that you're my followers if you love one another that we love each other um, the greatest proof that we're Christians that we Christians can give to the world is that as born again believers we manifest a selfless love in other words not self-directed not love of self but love of others and according to the Bible such love is the true keeping of the law aha well, now what kind of love is that Galatians chapter 5 verses 13 and 14 I want to read that love is an indicator <clears throat> to the world if you will that we're followers of Christ Galatians uh, chapter 5 and um, verses 13 and 14 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fetch that and post it and read it because it's talking about this love Okay, what kind of love would do that and here we go verse 13 for you were called to freedom brethren only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another or the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself so what we're talking about here is remember Christ summed up the law in two commandments he said the first is you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your body and the second is like unto it you shall love your neighbor as yourself and he goes on 
on these two, all of the, the commandments are founded. So it's not only two commandments, you love, your, you love God, you love your neighbor, the other eight are not possible, but these sum up the eight. See, the first core of commandments are our, are our duty to God, love of God, and the last six commandments are our duty to each other. Don't kill, don't lie, don't covet, don't steal, honor your father and mother. Those are commandments about your neighbor or each other. And what it's saying here <clears throat> is that <clears throat> it gives clear evidence that we are truly keeping the law because the law or the Ten Commandments is also known as the law of what? Of love. That brings us to the point of well, what kind of love is that? Well, what Jesus is talking about and is always talking about when he speaks love, and especially loving one another, is agape love. And what agape love means is it is not conditioned by the response of others. Remember when Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you? And that's not the kind of love we have for, for, for each other all too often. We're, it's easy. To, there's some people who are very lovable. They're nice. They're kind. But then there are those who try our very patience, and we say, "Hmm, oh boy, that guy is just difficult." But that person is to be loved by us. I saw a program on television uh, about one of the. I think it was a documentary on on the. Um, National Geographic and it showed this one of the most difficult prisons in this country and it was a guy in the prison um, who was you know one of the ringleaders of the gangs in the prison and he had killed a man which is what sent him to prison for life and uh, he, can, he killed this guy who apparently was innocent of any wrongdoing but he went up killed him shot him in the in the face point blank on this day some years later the mother of that young man and the man's wife, he was married, came to the prison so that they could confront this gentleman who had taken the life of their son and husband. And the guy was recalcitrant and he said, you know, I'll go visit these people, man, but I'm not going to be, you know, cowtown. And he says, I don't even feel sorry. You know, I'm going to just tell them like it is, you know. And there they were on opposite sides of a conference table. Very much like the table you see, you know, when they show you a picture of the president with his cabinet or negotiators in uh, negotiating something somewhere in Israel or, or Egypt, sitting across the table from each other. And it was difficult. The guy's head was down for a while and finally he said, now look, you know, I know you expect me to say that I'm sorry and, you know, that, 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 that uh, you want me, you know, that I want you to forgive me. And the mother said, no, 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 stop, stop, hold on. We, we're not asking, we're not here to forgive you. We already forgave you long time ago. Let me tell you something. That prisoner sank back in his seat. He was shaken by this, this mother of, a, of the boy whose life he took, saying, we forgave you a long time before we even came here. We hope, we hope that you will change and we pray for you. And the wife said, yeah, she was nodding too, yeah. And I thought to myself, so I think I'm a Christian. But man, if somebody hurt my daughter's I wonder if I would have the spirit that that mother manifested. Truly a daughter of Jesus Christ. Don't know what church she belongs to. It's immaterial because of the forgiveness in her heart. That's agape love. That's agape love. There was nothing that recommended that prisoner for love. In fact, he was hard. But you know what? He melted. 
He got up from that table, went back to his cell, and he was trying to turn his head from the camera because the tears were coming down his face. He couldn't believe it. The love of that mother was so great. And as great as that was, Jesus loves us even more. Because the person that we crucified, listen to me, was him. We didn't kill his brother. We killed him. Jesus would not have died on Calvary except that you and I perpetrated sin. And so for our sins, he died because he loved us. Greater love has no man than that he give his life for a friend. And so the kind of love that we manifest as Christians is this agape love, a love that is not based on the circumstance of like, but love is based on an initiative that comes from the heart. Because as followers of Christ, we love because he says that we ought to. And because he's forgiven us so much, we're able to forgive the little that others do to us, even before they ask, even without an apology. We forgive. We love. And it's certainly between one another, when you're in church and you're tempted to be annoyed at the person beside you, remember, greater love has no one. Remember that. The clear evidence that proves that we're followers of Christ is that we love one another. And then law keeping <coughs> is achieved. There's not a greater evidence, evidence of law keeping than that we love one another. That's what Paul was arguing. How is a person justified by God? Romans 8, 28 says that it, it's apart from works. We must constantly remind ourselves that we're justified or declared righteous before God based on faith alone. Justification by faith. We're justified by faith, and our faith is in Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he did die for our sins, that he was risen from death, and that he's in heaven interceding on our behalf, especially during the period of the judgment, which is going on right now. Law-keeping does not save us, but it is the evidence of our salvation. Therefore, we don't keep the Ten Commandments and the other laws in the Bible in order to be saved, but we keep our keeping of them demonstrates that we are saved. Remember Jesus said, if you love me, do what? What do we do if we love God? We keep his commandments. That's found where? 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. I'm going to post it because I want you to remember this. 1 John... <clears throat> Chapter 5, <coughs> excuse me, verses 1 through 3. Because some people read what Paul had to say and say, Aha! We don't need the law. We don't have to keep the law. We can do whatever we want to do. Uh-uh. If you do, if you break the law, it's an evidence against you. But if you keep the law, it's evidence that you're saved. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves God loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love that, that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. I like the way it's said in the King James better. It says, <clears throat> we know that, that if we love God, we will keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So when someone says to you, you know, keeping the commandments is a very arduous thing. It's a very weighty thing. It's a very difficult thing. It's because their hearts are not pure. They haven't been renewed. By, by the Holy Spirit. They have been trying to earn salvation through keeping of the law. You know that statement that says you can fool some of the people some of the time, 
but you can't fool, no, you can fool all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all the time. Anyway, something like that. And the point that I'm trying to make is this. In a courtship, when you first meet somebody and you say, hmm, she's good looking, that's a handsome guy. And you get to the point of introductions and you, just, you decide that you will do something together. Go somewhere and you say, man, I had a great evening. That person was so kind, good conversationist, um, gentleman, you know, she was a lady, et cetera, et cetera. And you may have that opinion, but you know what? You don't know that person. You've seen them for a few hours, and they have a lifetime to reveal to you. And that's the purpose of engagement. And so, Brother John is engaged, in getting to know Sister Natalie in ways that he had not known her before. And by the time they say, I do, they will know each other's every idiosyncrasy. And our love for Christ. <laughs> Our love for Christ is likewise. He knows all about us even before we were born. But as we continue to grow in grace and in knowledge of him, then our behavior is transformed into a loving behavior, not just for him, but for all those who we come in contact. And that's why God said, because if you've done this for the least of these, then you've done it unto me. How will we be judged in, in the investigative judgment? The investigative judgment, I remember I said, is the judgment that is going on that is investigating believers. It starts at the house of God. It's the righteous that are being judged. How, how are we judged? Revelation 20 and verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 12. What's the basis of the judgment? How does the judge reach a decision? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. I'm fetching it. And we're very at the end of our study, so another five minutes. <clears throat> and I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And many <clears throat> and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. What's the basis of our of our judgment? Our deeds. Our deeds. In other words, as King James calls it. The Tim James Version of the Bible calls it our works. So the Bible's clear that, that, that we sinners are justified by faith alone, apart from any good works that we do. Yet, as believers, we're judged and rewarded according to the works that we do. How do you reconcile this apparent contradiction? How do we reconcile that apparent contradiction that it's not our works that save us, but we will be judged for salvation based on our works. Is that a contradiction? Does that sound like a contradiction to you? And if it does, and this is scripture that says that, how do we reconcile that? Anybody? All right, well, let's, let me ask a different question. And these questions <clears throat> will help you to answer that other one. What is the greatest proof we can give that, we, that we're that we justified by faith? It's back in Matthew. All right? Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. I'll read it to you. 
You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so the answer, the first part of the answer is the greatest proof <clears throat> that we are justified by faith is our good works. The evidence is our good works. Okay? So the, the greatest proof that we have, or I said, how is that contradiction resolved? Is that when we look at the works of a person and, and their good works, we can say that that person has been justified by faith. Next question that's going to answer, help answer this as well. The, the answer is found in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. The question is, what did Christ redeem us from and why? Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. We're trying to because answer. Of the law. That's right. And Sal said, Our works don't save us or keep us saved. Our works are, are for the unbelievers. Yes, as, as I read. They, they are for the, the unbelievers, but they also give evidence to anyone who's looking that we are saved. Can't have good works if you. Are not in Christ. Remember the parable Jesus was talking and he said, uh, Can you get figs from thorns and thistles? Can you get fruit, good fruit, from a bad tree? No. So if you have good fruit, you get the good fruit from a good tree, and you get bad fruit from a bad tree. Jesus goes on about that in Matthew, by the way. And that is it. <clears throat> I read uh, Titus chapter 2 and 14. Who gave himself for us, that's Jesus, to redeem us from every lawless deed, for, for uh, every unrighteous deed, if you will, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Now, here's the import of good deeds. Jesus is saying, when he says he gave himself to us he died for us to redeem us remember I talked about the law of redemption back in Leviticus 25 and uh, he redeems us from every lawless deed meaning from every evil deed from everything that we did outside of the law or things that we did that were against the law and he wanted to separate which is a segue into a topic that I'm going to cover next week, the remnant. He separates a people, a unique people, for his own possession. And those people are characterized by their zealousness for good deeds or good works. So the Christian, the believer, is anxious in looking to do good deeds. Why? It's not unnatural. It's a natural response to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you. So, Christ redeems us from in iniquity or lawless deeds, meaning sinful acts. We're redeemed from that. He buys us back. He corrects that. He forgives us of that, and we don't do them anymore because why does he, why does he do that? He does it to purify us for himself so that we can do good deeds. Good deeds are important also to us because it's our purpose. It's what, uh, as Sal said, good deeds or the works that we do are for others, and that's exactly right. Translated into what Christ said, I'm going to use, turn, turn Sal's works around, and it says that we are the light of the world. In other words, when we behave in a fashion that generates good works, we bear witness that we are believers of a holy God. 
someone posted for me <clears throat> a couple of other chat texts first John 4 16 and we have known and believed the love that God hath for us God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him for this first John 5 3 is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous when we look at those two texts we must notice the word agape and agape is what the kind of love that is decided and is not based on a condition in some we in some we say of God that he loves us unconditionally all right what did the works of Abraham prove remember Abraham he did some works what would his work what did his works prove what am I thinking of let me be clear. Abraham was called upon to sacrifice his only son. Are you seeing some parallel here between Jesus and, and God? Abraham is called on to sacrifice his only son, puts him up on the altar, and is ready to carry out the killing and sacrifice of Isaac. Those were his works. Because he did that, Remember, there was a voice that came from heaven. Well, actually, it, was the, it says the angel stopped him. He said, Abraham, don't hurt the boy. And then he found there was a lamb or a ram, it says, that was caught in the thicket, takes Isaac off the altar. They go get the lamb and they sacrifice the lamb. And the point was, what? That because of Abraham's faith, it made him perfect. We'll read it for you. James 2, 22. James chapter 2 and verse 22. Absolutely correct, Al. James 2, 22. And here it is. You see that faith... <clears throat> Was, was working with was working with his works and as a result of the works faith is perfected uh, I'm going to post it also in the King James version um, some of you may know it uh, recognize it better in that in that uh, in that version and so I'll post it as well seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect remember in James it says can you have faith without works and James says oh no I will show you my faith or if I show you my faith you'll see my works they're not they're connected can't be separated Abraham's works prove that his faith was genuine he sacrificed Abraham uh, Isaac, he was ready to sacrifice him because he believed in God. God told him to do it, and he was going to do it, even though he he knew that that was the son that God had promised him. In the same way, our works of faith will be used by Christ, our advocate, to prove in the investigative judgment that our faith is true. As Satan accuses us, essentially he's doing what he did in his accusation of Job and this is why the book of Job is in scripture so that we can have some clarity I'm wrapping it up now because our time has expired what Job was faced with was that Satan said that Job was only being faithful to God because God had blessed him so he was the richest man of his time he had great wealth, a family that everybody envied. And so Satan said, that's the only reason that God, that, that Job serves you, God. <clears throat> if you took all this stuff away, he wouldn't, he'd curse you to your face. And so God says, okay, you can do that, but you can't touch him. And so his children die in one day. He loses all of his wealth, his possessions in one day. 
and still he's still faithful to God and by the way in that story there's an interesting um, action or works that demonstrate his faith it says that every day morning and evening Job would offer a sacrifice on behalf of his children he was interceding with God for his children and he'd offer a sacrifice because he knew they used to party and he was worried that at their parties they may dishonor God and so he said just in case they have sinned against God I'm gonna offer a sacrifice on their behalf okay so that was one of his works that proves that he believed at any rate Job said even though God kills me though he slay me yet will I trust him and that's the kind of faith that is exhibited in the works so when we have tough times whether it's loss of a job death of a loved one trying times patients wearing thin but we remain faithful in our agape love even for those who do us wrong it's strong evidence that we have been justified by faith and our faith is perfected in those good works what kind of works will not justify a person before God found in Galatians 2 16 so it's important to have this last thought Galatians 2 16 what kind of works will not help us before God Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Works of the law. Absolutely, Sal. Um, I'll read it instead of posting it. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified and I think the King James that's the King James version in another version it'll say you cannot be saved in other words keeping the law will not save us there's no salvation in the keeping of the law however law keeping is important why is it important it's evidence that we have been saved and as Sal pointed out before it is evidence to unbelievers that we're saved when somebody says man that person is really kind there's something about that person. I like him. I trust him. We're bearing witness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to others. Rapidly, <clears throat> according to Daniel, how many will stand in judgment? I'm looking at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10, he says that he saw the court seated, all the saints were there. He says there were 10,000 times 10,000. And David is describing this investigative judgment of the saints. And so while the saints themselves will not physically be present there, they will be represented by the great high priest and advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Zechariah talks about that in Zechariah chapter what? chapter 1 I think uh, chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 and I'll read that for you actually I'll post it so you can see it and thank you for the thank you uh, Rachel for the post of uh, of Galatians because that's an important text that I did not post and here it is in Zechariah and he showed me Joshua the high priest oh by the way by the way this is Old Testament correct what's the name for Jesus in Hebrew Yeshua 
Yeshua, Yeshua, which is Joshua. So here, Zechariah is talking about Jesus, not 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 the Joshua that marched around Jericho. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. That means God. Jesus before God. And Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. In other words, to be his antagonist in the court setting. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke you, rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? In other words, these are my chosen people. That's the believers. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Um, and I, didn't, I didn't post the last verse, verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with with a with change of raiment in other words the robe of Christ's righteousness uh, when you have time you might want to study that text look at it in, in some of the other translations I just read it to you in the King James and I didn't post verse 4 but I just read verse, verse, verse 4 for you because I want you to know what, what, what Daniel is saying about who will stand before the judgment seat of God ten thousands times ten thousands lots of people is the important in this judgment of the saints who will be vindicated of course it's the saints Daniel Daniel 7 and verse 22 Daniel 7 verse 22 indicates that the saints are justified and I'm just gonna fetch this text and I have one other text that I want to read and then we're done I uh, appreciate your indulgence um, doing what I hate to do, which is to go past 1030. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom, and that's the kingdom of God, that everlasting kingdom that we're talking about. For how long will the saints rule with Christ? Everlasting. Verses 26 and 27 of Daniel 7 make that clear. The consummation of the ages. All this time Satan and his kingdom will be forever destroyed. And in his place God will usher in his everlasting kingdom where peace will reign forever. <coughs> By faith we must plan to be there. I hope that this study of the investigative judgment gave some clarity to you. Remember that um, in the sanctuary there was the most holy place and in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant and above the Ark where the inside the Ark there was the Ten Commandments the Law of God and above it was the Mercy Seat and the Mercy Seat where the Shekinah glory was uh, which was evidence of God's presence is 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 likened remember the sanctuary as I said all of its all of its symbols pointed to Christ mercy came at the cross so when Jesus died on Calvary that was the mercy seat in mercy we are saved that's the gift that we receive cleansing from our sins and eternal life being at one with God our next uh, study on Tuesday will be the Day of Atonement, and this is the cleansing of the, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Um, those of you who understand it, those of you who don't, you will at the end of our next study. And then next Thursday, I'm going to talk about the remnant, uh, those who uh, keep the commandments of Jesus, as it says in Revelation. I hope that I've given some clarity about what we are to expect in these days the investigative judgment is going on now it is the judgment of believers and that is those who died in the past and those who are alive now and you don't know when your name comes up 
because you aren't personally present, but it does. And when Christ, when God declares you righteous, when probation ends, probation is the period we live in now. We have opportunity to seek forgiveness for any sins that we commit. Probation closes when you die or when Christ comes. Therefore, whichever is first is the close of probation for each individual. And that's important to understand. And it means that we cannot put off, we can't postpone our acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have to do it instantaneously when we find out the truth. Study the scripture, you find the truth, and you accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And when you do, <clears throat> when Satan accuses you before God as not being worthy, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is also propitiation. I'm quoting 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. He's propitiation for our sins, meaning that he provided the sacrificial atonement that brought us back to oneness with God, peace with God, and we're justified. And because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who gives testimony that we are indeed children of God, and the Father is the judge, being judged through Jesus, as it said, we have assurance that in the judgment we will be found faithful. What it says here is that the saints are vindicated, and Satan is proven to be the liar that he is. So hold on to your faith. Don't let Satan steal your crown. Henceforth, there's laid up for you in heaven a crown of righteousness. He that endures to the end shall be saved. God bless you. I hope this was beneficial. If anyone has any comments or any questions, I'll entertain them rapidly. Of course, if you have, have, have been following along in the study, and I have uh, encouraged questions to your mind, and you're unprepared at this moment to, to post them or to ask them, please, by all means, email us. Uh, the email uh, Mr. Spellman will post for us right now is ministry at inspiritednetwork.com. I'm more than happy to answer those questions as I did this evening with scripture. Because in the final analysis, you have to study and understand God's word for yourself. And that all that we're trying to do is to be faithful in our testimony of what God has done. So I thank you for your presence, and I look forward to seeing you um, next Tuesday. Um, God bless you as you reflect on your study this evening about the judgment. And um, it is my pleasure to be with you again. I thank God for the opportunity and for you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God in heaven, please bless each hearer of this study tonight. Please bless each person that was in the study and furnish them with your Holy Spirit and clarity about all that has been discussed so that they have peace in their hearts and understanding of your word. I ask that you continue to Hold each of us in the palm of your hand. Continue to provide for us as we remain faithful to you in words, in deeds, and especially in our actions. I want to give a special prayer of thanksgiving for my friend Sal on this day uh, because it's a special day to him, a day of deliverance in his life very real and very palpable and I know that Sal is going to be sharing his testimony with us 
but I want us all to be able to rejoice at what God has done for him in healing him a year ago today. It is, it is absolutely one of the most powerful things that I've heard about God's goodness. And it gives encouragement, and I've asked him to share his testimony with us. But tonight, Father, we give you thanks for your mercy and your blessing to him. And in so doing, we also remember the times that you have been so gracious to us, most of all by being patient enough with us to bestow upon us the truth of your word and what you're doing to save us. We thank you, O oh God, for your mercy. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you, and I look forward to uh, seeing you next week. Um, thank you so much, Leo. Thank you, Sal. Uh, God be praised, and uh, we'll see you both. God bless you. <clears throat> Good night. Thank you, Rachel. God bless. Be sure to tell Jesse I said hello and talked about him.